I, I wasn't planning to take to spend too much time on it, but I guess just to say that um, we were a bit concerned about the the audit and how the audit would go this year, partly because, of course, we've got a new chief financial officer, and I guess all the challenges that have been presented during the year because of COVID, and actually the audit was a it was in the end a very very smooth process, um, very easy to get through. So our thanks go to Gillian, um, in particular for that. Um, as you know, last year, then our report on the IGB was really critical and um, we expressed quite a lot of concerns about the the level of integration um, and some of the governance around the IGB. This year, then, um, we are reporting an improvement. So within um, our wider scope work, then last year it was a bit of a sea of reds. This year we are continuing to um, assess financial sustainability as red. But, but that very much reflects the sector and reflects the uncertainty around about funding and in particular in relation to um, some of the COVID activities. Um, but we did see you know, quite a lot of improvement in terms of the way the, the board works and in terms of the kind of green shoots of integration um, in particular. Um, we talked about value for money as well and about the annual performance report, which was um, which very much related to the annual um, performance report that was provided by the, the IGB and which again reflect a kind of mixed performance, but you're starting to see signs of improvement. So I guess that our, our overall assessment is that we're, we're kind of happy with the progress that the board has made um, this year. Um, a lot of the stuff around about the, in particular, the self-assessment against um, best value and against the ministerial steering group hasn't gone as planned, but I mean, that's because of COVID. So we're quite happy to to wait for next year to do all that kind of activity. But we're happy to take any questions. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a, a fair summary. We know there are some outstanding issues. We know there's been progress made, but yes, this year has been um, a little off track in many, many ways, and not least the, the, the way that the accounts were finalised, but it was great that we got them all, all, all done in time. Are there any comments then on the report, Alison? Ask a question at page twenty nine. At, at the bottom, it says we challenged management and the adequacy of some of the disclosures. So I just wanted a kind of a bigger, or maybe a larger explanation of what that meant and what the management, what, what Patricia and her team did in response. So that that really relates in particular to some of the going concern disclosures. So. Um, this year was a really unusual year because of um, COVID. Um, so normally in the public sector context, then going concern is not really an issue because um, you know, there are bodies who um, will be funded and um, will have government support. This year, was, there was a lot more interest in going concern because of um, the funding situation. So you know, whether the funding was going to be available to, to, to make up the, um, the increasing costs associated with COVID. But also a new um, international standard of auditing came in just at the exact wrong moment, which um, meant that we had a lot more um, back and forth, I suppose, around about going concern. And I feel sorry for Gillian because it's Gillian's first um, audit and we were going, and we're really worried about going concern. You need to do a going concern assessment and blah, blah, blah. Um, so um, during that process, then we had to consult internally on all audit opinions and all going concern assessments just because the firm um, took the view that it was such a risk for every single body that we audit. That, um, so we uh, we had more focus on that, and then our internal technical team had more focus on that. And all that meant was that as we were going through, um, we were asking for little changes to be made um, in terms of the disclosures. So it is things like um, how the funding works for IGBs. So we're uh, it was quite entertaining the conversations that Stephen and I had with a technical partner in London about what an IGB is and why it, why the ledger is the way it is and why. Ooh. So um, just to explain that background. So I guess that's not a that's not a criticism of the financial statements as as they were. That's just a reflection of this year was really tough. It was a really tough um, audit and it was um, a really um, there was a lot more focus on exactly what has been said within the disclosures. So it was just different this year. Yeah, ha ha having been asked by a colleague down south the other day, can you tell me in simple terms how health and social care integration works in Scotland? Um, <laughs> that that was my answer. No, but if you've got an hour. 
<laughs> okay, um, is 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 that satisfactory, Alison? Yeah. Okay, I think there, there there are clearly a number of of outstanding issues here from from last year as well, although some of them were were superseded, as you said. Um, we we know that action is being taken and is on board in relation to a number of these that fall into um, review of scheme of integration and one or two other things that have. Definite, definite plans there. So, I'm assuming this effectively forms the, the the work we will do this year, and that committee will be reported on um, progress over the next couple of meetings as we move forward on this. I guess the, the only thing to say about next year, um, because it came up this year, was Audit Scotland have asked us to to make a specific comment about how the IJB is able to demonstrate best value. Um, so they haven't done that in previous years. They brought it in this year, which was a bit unfortunate because of um, the COVID situation. So I suppose that's been one of the areas that Gillian and I have, have discussed around about that, that um, self-assessment process for um, demonstrating best value, uh, because it's one of the areas that we're going to come back to, to next year. So um, it would be helpful to have that kind of thought, thought formed before we start that audit. Okay, that's something then we can discuss at a future meeting. Okay, any other points or questions on the external audit report? Gordon, probably just to say that it's, it's worth noting that we have put quite an ambitious timescale against the five recommendations as well, because we kind of do recognise that we want to move things forward. So, in terms, I guess, of the kind of first two recommendations around the, the medium term financial plan and updating that. And also to reflect the pandemic, that is obviously work that's underway at the moment. So we'd anticipate to have that, you know, complete by March, which was the, the deadline. But the others are, are slightly more tricky, and we have got the kind of June and March deadlines attached to them. So as Grace says, we'll we'll form a kind of plan around how we tackle that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we, we we obviously know that there's there's an awful lot going on right now. Um let alone what's been going on the rest of this financial year. But um, there, there, there are a couple of kind of fundamental issues here that, that we do need to get to, to grips with, not, not least the, the review of the integration scheme, which has implications for quite a number of issues on today's agenda. Okay, can, can we agree that report then? Okay, thanks, Grace. Can we go back then to item four on the agenda? Which is the terms of reference? Yeah, the terms of reference. I thought it would be helpful to have this on the the agenda today, just given that Gordon and myself are, are new to the to the group. So there were um, a number of kind of minor changes that were recommended last year around um, the in, internal audit recommendations. So. The terms of reference were updated to reflect that, and the papers were published and ready to go to the twentieth of March. IJB meeting last year, but because it was right in the middle when the COVID um, impact started, so the agenda was curtailed to only deal with urgent business, so it was never ever reviewed by the IJB. However, it was subsequently approved by Patricia and the Chair and Vice Chair of the IJB under the Delegated Powers. So I thought, as I say, it would be helpful just to bring it back today so that the committee could see the changes that were actually recommended by this um, committee last year and whether there needs to be any further update. So happy to kind of take any comments on the terms of reference as they stand. Yeah, and it all seemed fairly straightforward to me. The, the, the amendments make perfect sense, and if they were as previously agreed by the committee, then that should be fine. Anyone have any other comments or questions? No. Okay, so given that this has been agreed by the IJB, this is just to note that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll note that. Um, where are we? Item six then is the supplementary paper, isn't it? Strategic risk register. Okay, yep. So the, the risk register will come to, to every quarterly um, audit committee meeting. So this is just the latest update. So there continues to be 11 risks recorded on the risk register, 10 of which are considered to be high risk and one as medium risk. And there has been no new risks added from the last version that was presented to the audit committee back in September. 
In terms of Section 4 of the report, it just gives a very kind of high level summary in terms of the actual risk position. And you can see there's been actually an adverse change in one of the risks, and that's in relation to capacity and infrastructure. So risk number four, that was previously low, but we've changed it to medium. That was through review by the senior leadership team meeting um, last week, I think, week four. Um, and it really reflects a number of things, I guess, in terms of capacity, which has been impacted due to the ongoing impact of COVID. The potential for the IGIB to be a Category 1 responder and the implications that that has in terms of emergency planning support. And also the fact that there's probably a, a further piece of work required just to clarify some of the governance arrangements around the NHS SLT and, and, and the programme boards and how that works. So we felt it would be appropriate to change that to, to medium at the moment. So that was the only one where there was a, there was a change at the moment. i um, happy to take any questions in the actual detail. You can see the, the draft um, updated strategic risk register is attached to Appendix 1. That will go back to the leadership team meeting in December just to finalise the changes that are made following our discussion in November. OK, Alison. Yeah, um, I think our previous audit we decided that we, we were going to try and reduce some of the risks because there was so many, and I think obviously because of COVID, that's just not been possible. It's 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 exacerbated. What was yeah. But the it was just a comment. I had I had to take a magnifying glass to read the risk register. I I really can't read it. So if maybe for next time we could maybe make it bigger. You know yeah. the, the actual. Because it's just real, almost impossible to actually read. There's so, an awful lot in it. Absolutely, I uh, do agree. I wonder if we can present it in a, just, an in easier a bigger, like, format. Even, yeah. even if every every page that's there that takes up half a page was a page, it might be easier to read. Eh? Yeah, I, I think I've I've actually struggled to actually, and I, I mean the last couple of audit committees I've went through everything with a fine tooth comb and asked loads of questions, but I'm just struggling to read it. No, that's a really fair point. I'll take that back and ask um, Lorraine to have a look at the format and how we could improve that then. Right, thanks. Certainly. It's, it's, it, I, I was thinking it's fine on my tablet, but then I noticed that I was at about 170%. Um, so having yeah. a larger font certainly did help. I mean, yeah, there, there, there are a lot of risks and there's a lot of red on it, which is always alarming when you look at it. But um, that's that's kind of where we are for all the reasons that you you, you outlined, Gillian. Um I, I think there's there's only one that's increasing, which I guess in the current scheme of things is actually not bad. A number of them do tie into the things that we've we've talked about in terms of the audit plan, financial position, and review of integration. So um th there are definite plans in all of these, I think. Um it's again I think some of them it's going to be fairly tight with the time scales that are allocated to some of the actions. So I, I think that as we know there is an awful lot of work still to do. Ryan, you wanted to come in. It's more just to say if uh, I can speak to Jelly after, if we can't change the layout, we could possibly and what we used to do when we were in the buildings was print off the appendices like an AC format. So at the very worst we could give you, you know, kind of much bigger screen, but we can probably try and see whether we can change the layer or change the, the font size, but that's a last resort we can do. Yeah, I mean, we have spoke about using Pentana to actually pull the reports together, so I don't know if there's functionality within that system that would make it easier to try, and so I'll have a word with you, Coyle, as well, um, to see if we can we can make an improvement. Okay, we'll leave you to, to, to sort that out between meetings. Patricia? Yeah, <laughs> yeah just for information, in doing a bit of work, NHS Forth Valley has a new risk manager in post, which is very welcome. And so we've been doing a bit of work at the systems leadership team to re redo the risk register for NHS Forth Valley and um, also to align the partnerships risk register so that it's feeding through. And Pintana will be part of that solution. But it was just of worthy of note that the NHS board had actually downgraded the risk around the delivery of integration, but given our audit reports and the ongoing challenges, um, you know, I've been feeding through that actually they might want to reconsider that in terms of where we're at. But we're, we're doing a piece of work to better align the associated risk registers in the IGBs to that of NHS Force Valley. So I think it's important that we do have that synergy across the system, and particularly 
so that you as board members can see consistency from what you're receiving the IGB and, and what's bubbling up at the board. Thanks. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. A bit of consistency where possible is, is, is always good. Any other points or comments? No. Um, is is there anything to to update on Patricia in, in relation to risk four? Given that that is the one that's that's increased, um, that there are a number of items there in terms of actions, a couple of which are red. You're on mute. Um. We are, in terms of our permanent capacity, we're out for recruitment at the moment for a number of key posts. We've also been working very closely with the corporate management team in the council and with Sarah as chief social work officer to look at how the council could support us to um, potentially provide us with back office and other capacity volunteers to move um, and be deployed within our systems to support the delivery of care. Um, we've also, um, through the council, got widespread advertising, a rolling advertising programme, working with the colleges um, to directly target students in relevant courses to offer them um, part-time employment and placements. So there's quite a lot of work going on um, in anticipation of some of the challenges we'll have over the next couple of months, um, should the modelling, national modelling work um, be accurate. Um, we have been working at times with a 20% staff absence across our care um, staff and care at home. Um, so we have a robust process in place to assess against business continuity plans on a daily basis. We have a huddle with the staff to assess our staffing levels across the system. As you'll be aware, we've had um, in response to COVID to go in and provide senior management support into some care homes. Um, which has obviously shifted our resource. So we're doing a daily um, assessment of the risk and looking at how we better deploy our staff at the same time as responding to community referrals and discharges from hospital. So I think it's fair to say that um, we're managing to keep services safe, um, but we are we are under pressure and we're anticipating over the Christmas period and early in the new year that pressure will not um, lesson off at all. So it's a testament to our staff and um, the way that we're managing. A lot of our staff are going above and beyond. Um, but in the first phase of COVID, we had more resilience in the system because so many um, hospital admissions were reduced because of the cessation of elective care, but also um, you know, a, a number of services across the system were not in place, but we're trying to you know, retain services at the same time as responding to the pandemic. So it is an ongoing challenge, but we're getting great support across the system from our providers and from our colleagues. Um, but it is a challenge. The vaccination programme and the testing programmes are going to put additional demands on care homes and on our logistics to get our care at home staff who are a dispersed mobile workforce. To be able to ensure that they are tested regularly will be um, just another challenge that we'll need to rise to. So it's no different to any other partnership or IGB across the system. Um, we just we are where we are, and we've just got to um, do our best. Um, but really, keeping things safe is at the front of our minds. But it is an ongoing challenge. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are there are several challenges, each of which on their own would be difficult to to cope with, uh, let alone four or five of them at once. I don't think anyone underestimates the tremendous work you and your team have been doing to to keep people safe through all of this. Okay, any other comments then on the risk register? Okay, can we note that? Item seven then is um, program of meetings and work plan for twenty twenty one. Yeah, this is a, a usual agenda item at this stage in the year where we look forward to next year and the the meeting dates and the indicative work plan. So I guess the kind of key thing to point out is there is four dates um, in the diary, and I'm just wondering whether they are 
you know whether people can make them because I know Alison you had raised previously there was some clashes before so you're okay for what it came good excellent so that's the four dates then and we will we'll get that formalized with, with meeting invites in terms of the actual work plan you can see in the appendix the kind of number of reports that we'd expect to come and when and which meetings they would come to so I don't know if there's anything that's missing from that um, or anything that you'd expect to see at a different stage in the year I think the, the the key items all seem to make sense. Yeah, to me. Right. Um, obviously, on 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 the assumption that that next year's accounts process is going to be back to the the standard time scale, but I, I guess that's something we won't know about for a while yet. <laughs> we love and hope. <laughs> Um, just to say on that, that um, Audit Scotland have again extended out the deadlines for the audits, but this year for the IGB we were really close to having met that um, time scale, so I think that we should be fine for next year. We know what we're doing. Thanks, Grace. Alison? Just to ask about the external audit mentioned about self-assessment, and I recommend, and I just wondered where that would fit in. You know, I know that Patricia responded to that and I can't find the page now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wondered how that would fit in. Maybe it's too early, but how it, 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 page 51, uh, the, the IGB has not yet conducted a self-assessment against guidance. I just wondered if that could come up in the in the, in our work plan, if that should come in the work plan or does it fit in somewhere else? I suppose it would go to the IGIB, but yeah, I wonder whether this committee would have a would have a view around some of the detail of that. It's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, if if it can be fitted in with the time scale, it would make sense for it to come here first. I would say. Right. Okay. Any other points or comments? Okay, so with that addition, then can we agree the dates and work plan for next year? Okay, we're all in my diary already, so should be fine. Um, item A is the National Order and Inspection Report Overview. Do you know, can I, so just before Sorry. we start, can I just ask, um, are people happy if I do the invites today and we use Teams for next year? Are we all able to use that or you prefer to use WebEx? It depends. I'm not sure whether um, I think yeah, Patricia are onto Teams. I'd I'd prefer Teams personally. I have to say, I've, it's been a while since I've used WebEx. So this morning, I'm like, oh, where's the buttons? Yeah, I'm sort of, of continually jumping between Teams, WebEx, yeah. and Zoom at the moment. So it's, it's nice such to a have a consistent platform. <laughs> I think I issued the clinical care on Teams, which is mm. more a, a thoughtless process rather than um, maybe should have. But if we can maybe do that, that may be helpful just to try and move everybody over to a consistent platform. Yeah. Yeah, I'm seeing nods, so I think teams should be fine, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item eight, Jillian. Okay, so this is a standing agenda item which summarises a range of reports that have been considered by the Clinical and Care Governance Committee, but also a number of national inspection and audit committee reports as well that have been issued recently. So I would take you straight to section four in the report. So there was three national reports that were published recently that we've included in the report. The first one was an Audit Scotland report in relation to equal pay. That particular report was more in relation to Audit Scotland's um, position on equal pay rather than an overview of the public sector or, or health and social care. I'm not entirely sure it's, it's relevant, but I included it anyway, given that it had been published. Um, the second report from Audit Scotland was the scrutiny um, response to COVID-19, so yet another COVID-19 report, and it just highlights a number of risks that are facing certain key elements of the public sector in terms of education, health, social care, housing, fire and justice. And it also makes a number of recommendations on how we can actually build on some of the, the excellent integrated work that has been um, carried out during COVID. I think everybody has kind of recognised that it's really showcased the benefits of integration. The other report is the Health and Sport Committee report, which was recently published. And this is effectively their, their pre-budget scrutiny report. And there, there's quite a significant number of recommendations and requests for information 
arising as a result of that particular report, and Falkirk does actually get a mention at page 17. Um, all integration authorities were asked to complete a survey by the Health and Sport Committee, which we duly did. Um, there's a couple of issues, I guess, in that particular report, which, which kind of stood out for me. Um, and we've already touched on some of this this morning, just in terms of that progress with the integration agenda, and there's specific actions around where we are at against the, the ministerial steering group proposals in terms of progress. And we have been contacted yesterday by the Scottish Government to ask for our current position around six of those 25 MSG indicators, um, which are specifically relating to finance. So this is going to be a focus, I think, kind of nationally and, of course, locally. We've already highlighted it as an issue. Um, also, um, there was a specific chapter in that report on the set aside budget, and there there was a meeting this week around that locally because we recognise there is outstanding work there still to be uh, completed. The only other area I had picked up was around social prescribing, um, and I wonder if there's local action for us in that particular one um, that the the partnership funding group could perhaps consider. Um, if I can find the page in the report. Yeah, and that was kind of recommendations, I guess, around the kind of level of expenditure. Those recommendations about what that percentage should be. Um, I mean, we are spending 466k around social prescribing type projects, so I wondered if that is something for the, the partnership funding group to consider, given that we are actually looking at the kind of next three year investment programme for the partnership funds anyway. The timing is probably quite good in that. So that was the kind of the key points that I had, I had drawn from that particular report. The others are inspection reports in section five, and there's a number of obviously Embry, Air Home, Unannounced, um, no other in, the, in that fortnightly report from the care inspector. There's been no other local ones. And again, that's been considered by the Clinical and Care Governance Committee. So I don't know if there's any other questions on that particular report. No, firmly the, the the social prescribing issue is the one that I had noted down as as possibly one that we would need to take action on. But it sounds like you're ahead of me anyway in that one. Are there any other comments or questions, Alison? Yeah, it was just regarding Burnbury. I'm usually pretty sharp at reading reports and keeping up to date. And I must admit, I've been slacking because I haven't even checking. You know, our care homes have been pretty quick, as Robert will probably agree to check the the Mental Welfare Commission one. So I'm, I'm slapping my own wrist there because I'm quite annoyed at myself for no having picked up. And also, I'll have a chat with Martin and Lorraine because at my monthly meetings, it's not been mentioned. I didn't know about it till I read, you know, till I read about it. So I think it's important that things like that are highlighted to the portfolio holder and the and the, the spokespersons for the group say because uh, for, for 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 just for scrutiny and for. For peace of mind, eh? So that was, that was all. What I just... like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Alison. Anyone else? Okay, can we note that report then? Thanks, Gillian. Um, 